Dana Reese is a senior columnist for Religion News Service and the author or co-author of many books. Unfortunately, we don't have any of them besides the one you came to hear about tonight because we've sold them all, uh, which is good. But we do have one used copy of the Twible, which is all of the chapters of the Bible in 140 characters or less. So the Twitter Bible, basically. So <clears throat> we ought to have an auction since we only have one copy. So I will see if I can get it up to like 50 bucks. Um, anyway, she has also, uh, of course, her most famous book is What Would Buffy Do? The Vampire Slayer as Spiritual Guide. I actually had one to show you. I've got one at home. But uh, she also uh, co wrote with uh, Chris Bigelow Mormonism for Dummies, which ought to make most of us feel pretty comfortable. Um, the uh, Mormonism and American Politics, which I'm afraid we just sold out of. Uh, she has a blog, Flunking Sainthood, and did a book by that name, uh, A Year of Breaking the Sabbath, Forgetting to Pray, and Still Loving My Neighbor. It's a, it's a delightful book. Um, any of any books that she's done or that others have done that are out of print, usually we can find for you. So let us know if there's something uh, that we can find for you in terms of uh, LDS books that are in print or out of print. And, uh, we also have rare books for those of you who may be interested. Um, so if you need a Book of Mormon uh, first edition for only 85000 or so, I'm the one to talk to. Tonight uh, we're going to hear from Jana talking about the next Mormons, how millennials are changing the LDS church. Of course, the next edition will have to be the next <coughs> members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> I don't know if you saw the announcement, official announcement from the church today about all the websites and all the proper names will be used from now on. So that's you're going to have to talk to the people at Oxford about that, Jan, and get that corrected. Um, Oxford University Press uh, has produced a a fine book here, um, which if you, if you, unless you take the dust jacket off, you may not, you can see this from at least a mile away, in the dark, hot pink, very appropriate. Um, so, she, when I, I've known Jenna for a long time, and uh, as much as I like to give her a hard time, and vice versa, uh, I do consider her one of my best friends. Uh, she's been a wonderful and loyal friend. Puts up with a lot for me. Um, so she got her PhD in American religious history from Columbia University and at one time was the book, uh, religion book editor for Publishers Weekly. Um, she's done countless articles and is kind of the go-to person now uh, for the issues that are so current. Um, uh, especially regarding uh, not just millennials in the church, but uh, a lot of issues. She has become uh, a person that um, people want to get answers from or uh, a perspective from. And uh, so I'm going to turn the time over to Jana Reese now. Thank you. All right, how's that? I'm not a, a loud mouth like some people we may know. There are a lot of them. I don't know. I don't know. I'm so grateful to Kurt for hosting this event and also to all of you for coming. This is quite a crowd for this space. Um, I guess that there are people in the hallway. I'm sorry, oh, marginalized people in the hallway. This is an entire book about trying to welcome people on the margins, so I feel a little guilty that I'm making people just like that. So. Um, this book started as something entirely different. It started as a book about Mormon childhood and adolescence, which I, as a non-Mormon growing up, found very fascinating to hear the stories of people, once I became a Mormon, who had grown up in this faith and had such a different childhood 
than mine in, in ways that were both good and maybe not so good. Um, and over time, as I was thinking about those questions and starting to do preliminary interviews back almost seven years ago now, uh, it became something more about how those people became adults and about religious retention. Um, I became really interested in some of the questions about what's happening in the relig religious landscape more generally in America. So you won't be surprised probably to hear that we are seeing disaffiliation in the church, but we're also seeing it everywhere right now. And what's happening in the Mormon faith is really just one part of this larger story of what's happening in religion in America. How many people here are millennials? which we'll just kind of define in a squishy way of born in the 1980s and 90s. Okay, thank you for coming. Because I hate talking about you to you know people who are not millennials, and then the conversation tends to devolve into, oh, there's kids today, or something like that. So thank you for coming, and uh, hopefully you can stand up for yourselves. If, if the conversation ever turns in that direction, the older I get, maybe I'll be more, more like that too. Um, I would like to read the beginning of a chapter. This was based on one of the interviews that I did. Um, we have data from almost 1,700 people, and those findings are in this book. And then I have 63 oral history interviews. In fact, tonight I was so delighted to meet the father of one of my millennial interview subjects, so that was quite a treat for me. <clears throat> this particular story, when I was on the phone, I was trying hard to, uh, to remain professional and to not get emotionally involved, which turned out to be an issue with several of the, the interviews that I did because these stories were things that I found so powerful and important in uh, understanding faith in general as well as understanding these young adults' experiences with the church. So this one was one of my favorites. It's the opening of Chapter 7, which is called Rainbow Fault Lines. LGBT inclusion. Speaking of aging, Kurt, the last time I did a reading here, I never needed these glasses. So, that's new. When he was 13 years old, Ellis, now 24, confessed to his bishop that he thought he might be gay. Ellis was appalled at the thought. Growing up as the 10th of 11 children in a traditional Mormon family, he had imbibed the belief that homosexuality was an abomination, something to be ashamed of and overcome. In fact, he wondered whether he could ever be forgiven. In a primary class, he had once asked his teacher what the church meant by the infinite atonement of Christ. Did that mean that even Satan could be forgiven? The teacher said, no, of course. Satan could not be forgiven. Some horrors were simply out of bounds. This caused him to wonder, what is too bad to be forgiven? Mm -hmm. How far is too far? If I'm like this for the rest of my life, what does that mean? <clears throat> Feeling guilty, he confessed his anxiety to the bishop, whose reaction was to pack Ellis off to an LDS therapist for counseling in Houston, a couple of hours away. Quote, my bishop's comment was that this therapist would fix me which was welcome news to me. I think the bishop saw that it would become more of an issue when I was older, and he wanted to pass the baton to the therapist about my sexuality. Ellis begged the bishop not to tell his parents why he was being sent for counseling, and the bishop honored this wish. So his mother did not know, as she drove him to his sessions every Tuesday, that he was seeing a therapist because the bishop thought it would be the best way to cure him of thinking he was gay. For his part, Ellis was relieved at the hope that a professional might be able to help him. He had been disgusted when he first said the G word aloud to himself in the sixth grade. He knew he was different in noticeable ways from his brothers and his god friends. <coughs> and like most people going through puberty, his main desire was to fit in. He wanted to try to change. At the first appointment, the LDS therapist closed the door to the office and told Ellis they could speak privately. At this point of the interview, my heart was pounding with terror about what this therapist was about to say. And the therapist said, your bishop told me that your parents don't know why you're here because you don't want them to. Then came the statement that shocked Ellis. The bishop asked me not to make you gay anymore. But that's not how this works. That's impossible. You don't need fixing. Ellis recalls, <laughs> 
his very next comment was, let's talk about penises. And I was like, is this a trap? <laughs> but it wasn't a trap. He just normalized stuff that I was feeling terrible about. That was a very liberating feeling, to have him tell me that everybody my age checked out other people's bodies in the locker room. He said, there are things you can fix about yourself, and this isn't one of them. Let's focus on the things you can change, like self-esteem and how to fit in to a heterosexual society. Then he encouraged me to get out of Texas. <laughs> Ellis did indeed get out of Texas. He graduated early from high school, served an LDS mission in Italy, and is now a full-time student in New York. He remains very close with his family and says he's proud of them for the, quote, huge concessions and compromises, unquote, they have made with his coming out. To pay for school, he's interning at a private equity firm and works two other jobs. He still prays every day and attends institute regularly, even though he doesn't go to church on Sundays. He misses some aspects of going to the temple, which he used to visit frequently, and feels a little wistful whenever he's down near Lincoln Center and sees the Manhattan Temple. But he also feels free and whole. His, quote, new openness and big P rainbow font pride, unquote, is not a detour or a disconnect from his Mormon upbringing, he explains, but another piece of the same journey. And he still remembers that LDS therapist with gratitude and fondness. When I'm processing things or decompressing, I remember what he said, Ellis says. Because it was such a positive experience, I'm glad that he was part of my life formation. It was very important to me mm -hmm. to start that particular chapter with a positive story. Because, frankly, there are a lot of stories that do not turn out that well. I just actually, two weeks ago when I was in Utah, got an update uh, from Ellis's brother about how he's doing. And it sounds like things are going really well. He graduated, he is working full-time, enjoying his job, starting a relationship. It's a good story. I am intensely grateful to the young people who opened up their lives to me because the interview template, like the survey itself, asked people questions that, wow, uh, are not necessarily polite conversation, questions about your family, your upbringing, how you felt about your, uh, your faith as a child, how do, you, how do you feel about your faith now, how was your first temple experience, um, tell me about your sex life, right? And it is a tremendous privilege as an interviewer to have people trust you with their stories. That is a gift that I certainly don't take for granted. And I hope that the people that I interviewed for the book are happy. They, they had an opportunity to look at what was going to be said in terms of their quotes, not how I would interpret them, but in what they said, and to edit that if they needed to. And some of them did and some of them didn't, but they did have that opportunity. I have, Kurt actually for once was not exaggerating. He is someone who is prone to a bit of exaggeration, but when he said this is my fifth event today, that was not actually an exaggeration. This is the fifth time I have either spoken or given an interview about this research, and I've been talking probably about six hours total about data. Part, that's part of the reason why I wanted to actually just talk about the interview and tell a story. But in the remainder of our time, what I want is just to have a discussion and to answer questions. I know some people have already started reading the book over social media over the weekend. I fielded four different people asking me about one particular finding about garments and sex. So if that, And Doug Fabrizio asked me the same question today in the Radio West interview, and he had that section highlighted, so I was Oh, okay. <laughs> so if you want to talk about that, we can talk about that. But anything that's in the book or the process of writing the book, um, and I also forgot to mention that my dear friends, Ray and Roberta Black, are here, uh, not joking to call them my Utah parents. <clears throat> 23 years ago, when I was researching my dissertation, their daughter, who was in my ward in New Jersey, and I were, were talking about this, my first trip ever to Salt Lake City, I think, or maybe, maybe my second. I had been here as a tourist. Um, and I said, I'm going to need to stay somewhere. You know, what should I try to find a room at the university? And what should I do? And she said, oh, no, no, don't do that. Stay with my parents. And I said, I don't know your parents. I, you know, I can't stay with them. And I, I'm talking like going out for two weeks to do research in this archive. They're not going to want to put up a total stranger. But they did, and we have been dear friends ever since. And every time I come to Salt Lake, I'm delighted to stay in their house. So 
It's like I have family here. So thank you. Anyway, let's have some questions about the book or your observations about millennials. Yes? I'm curious. Each generation has something to say about the other next generation. Yeah. I'm just curious if, if you feel like this one is any different or whether it's just a group of people born, you know, in the uh, age of technology. I, I'm just mm -hmm. curious. If that's Good right. question. I'm going to repeat the question in case people in the back couldn't hear or also for the video for people. So, sorry if that's <coughs> awkward. But the question was, is there something truly different about this generation, or is it the case that we see in history more generally where the elderly are very concerned about the young, and that happens again and again? So, from the perspective of religious history, yes, it's very different. So, we have enough longitudinal data stretching back from the 1960s to the present about how people who were in their 20s, or how people who were 12th graders, or 10th graders, or 8th graders, in school over these years felt about religion and how they behaved. Did they attend religious services and you know, how did they feel about that? And the, the declines are real. So the, the religious affiliation question and the religious attendance question among college freshmen, uh, religious disaffiliation has tripled. The number of people who no longer attend religious services has tripled. This is America more generally, not just Latter-day Saints. So that part is different. The religious landscape change is absolutely real, and I don't think it's going away. This is not the sort of thing that you can say they're going to come back when they get married or they have kids. Um, and another problem with that argument is that this is a generation that is waiting later in general to, have, to marry or to have children, and they're having fewer children. So if that's your logic for how they're going to be reactivated into religion, it's a little bit different. Does that help? Yes. Um, I get the impression that society in general and the church doesn't understand the difference between millennials and youth. And a, a youth? Is yeah. that okay? And so, like, um, the church seems to be addressing the needs of, like, college students and, and literally youth and missionaries, you know, that kind of age group, not realizing that they aren't millennials. Mm -hmm. Do you see evidence that the church is actually addressing the needs of us millennials, that the, you know, what's the age range now, like mid-twenties to late-thirties? Do you actually see it? I don't see a lot, but do you see evidence of that? I would say that it is spotty. So the, the question is, is there um, a, an effort on the part of the church to address the needs of millennials apart from the needs of youth? Some of this I talk about in the singles chapter because there does seem to be a pervasive attitude in the church that singles are infantilized. Uh, one of the interview subjects talks about going to a singles ward activity and being fed Capri suns and fruit snacks. Uh, another talks about doing activities where they, they had flower balloons. It's like water balloons, but then when you break them, the flower goes all over the person. She said, I wouldn't have enjoyed that when I was eight. Why would I do it now when I'm in my 20s? Um, also, there is a, a leaked video from the Brethren talking about young adults from 2008 that's on YouTube. And in the course of that conversation, it was very interesting to hear how Elder Packer was referring to young single adults. This is not all millennials, but young single adults. Um, really emphasizing the role of parents and how they are still under the jurisdiction of, of their parents and their families. which suggests that the way that he was seeing them is still in the youth paradigm that you're talking about. I think there's a lot of work to do. Um, there are certainly great and interesting models in what other religions are doing in this time, particularly in extending leadership opportunities to young adults that we don't really have a parallel for outside of the very structured environment of a singles ward where young adults do have leadership but they're still supervised by, by older people. <clears throat> yes? Have you developed any relationships with any senior leaders of the church, men or women, to whom you can have a trusted conversation about? I issues? have not. I do not have those relationships. Sorry, yes, the question was, do I have relationships with senior leaders of the church, either uh, male or female, that where I could share this research with them, and no, I, I don't have that. I mean, of course, every researcher hopes that people who are in positions of influence and are able to make changes may encounter something in their research that sparks an idea, but 
That is way beyond my control. I, if that happens, wonderful. What has been very exciting, though, is to see on the local level how many bishops, Relief Society presidents. Today I spoke to seminary teachers um, and to marketers. You know, a lot of people are very interested and concerned about young adults in the church on the grassroots level, and that's pretty great. How have you viewed your membership in the church in light of all the information that you've gathered with this book? Has it changed it? Is it? Mm. Um, how do you how do you view things? Well, this is a flippant answer to your question. The question was, how has this research changed my uh, own membership in the church? I've started drinking <coughs> diet coke. <laughs> <laughs> this research changed my life, and the way that happened was that. In, when I joined this church in 1993, I gave up all caffeine and um, for 25 years, happily, or maybe perhaps sometimes grumpily, <laughs> did not have caffeine. And then when I saw the data of how many Mormons were drinking cold soda, I thought, why am I doing this? <laughs> so the herd mentality took over and passed me to code zero, and it's been like that ever since. <laughs> so that's the flippant answer. I think in terms of, of how this helped my perspective, several different things in the book were very important for me emotionally. One of them was researching the singles chapter and talking to singles in the church, both men and women. Um, that's my favorite chapter in the book. It was my favorite thing to write. Talking about patriarchal blessings, I wish that we had asked a survey question about patriarchal blessings. We didn't. It's not part of the survey inventory. But when I was doing the oral history interviews, people kept bringing it up. And millennials were talking about their own experiences of their patriarchal blessings and how they interpreted them over time. So then I added that to the questionnaire, started asking other people. And it became, for me, a very interesting window into questions of authority. Because in the chapter toward the end of the book on institutional authority, which millennials are distant from, or relational authority, horizontal authority, which seems to be more, um, more effective in reaching millennials. And patriarchal blessings kind of fit in the middle. They, they are hyper-personalized, and this is an era where you get to go to Chipotle and choose exactly what you want to go on your burrito, and you're walking around with your phone that has your playlist and your favorite music. Life has really never been quite so customized for us as it is right now. And patriarchal blessings are poised to be very resonant with a generation that has grown up expecting that kind of customization. On the other hand, they are completely done through the institution of the church. And in some of the interviews that I had, it was actually the institution of the church that seemed to validate the patriarchal blessing for them, even if they had conflicting feelings about the church. So that was very interesting to write about. And it also, on the personal level, uh, caused me to think quite a lot about my patriarchal blessing, which was a very special experience. Um, from my perspective as a millennial and my anecdotal perspective, I've noticed it seems like there's been a shift from absolutism and universal truth amongst millennials um, to open their thoughts to more of like a moral, moral relativism, mm -hmm. um, that there's opportunity for truth in all things. I'm just curious in your conversations and research um, if you see that shift amongst millennials within the church. Yes, and that's a great question. The question is about how millennials see truth, and is there a kind of trend toward relativism within millennials in the church as we see in the larger society? And the answer is yes. I think that a good takeaway is that millennials who are in the church are kind of caught between the values of their culture, and particularly their parents and grandparents from previous <laughs> generations, and the values of their peers who are not LDS. And they're often in between what we know about the millennial generation from other surveys of America more generally, and then what we know about how older Mormons feel about certain questions. So in the authority chapter, we have a, a whole bunch of questions about institutional authority, both how they feel about it, like if push came to shove, would you trust your own conscience or would you obey a priesthood authority, um, versus their behavior. How many of you are watching General Conference? That was very interesting because generationally it is declining in a pretty significant way. I saw someone in the back on that side. 
talk about the methodology. I think you say it's a representative sample of folks in the U.S. Yes. Um, and so, how did you, how did you uh, get your sample, and did you get kickback or assistance from structures within the church in terms of uh, the people you were able to access? So this is a methodology question of how we obtained the survey sample and whether the church was involved in any way. So no, the church was not involved in any way. This is entirely independent research that Benjamin Knoll of Center College and I conducted uh, using Qualtrics, which is a marketing research firm and academic research firm actually based here in Utah. Interestingly enough, that was a coincidence. Um, and the way that you find these people is that there are millions of Americans who take surveys. Anybody here in part of one, one of these groups where you can sign up to take surveys? Okay, we see a few hands. Me too. I signed up for this because I was so curious. Who the heck are these people who take surveys? And at first, I was pretty reluctant to reveal personal information, and now they know everything. You know, I drive a Subaru and uh, whatever. My politics, my religion. Over the course of their data collection of these millions of people who take surveys, you know, they know, do you prefer Charmin or Angelsoft? And if you said Angelsoft, and somebody wants later to do a survey on toilet paper, you're part of a panel of people who may be respondents for that survey. So that's how we got 23,000 people who were potential respondents for our survey, and then we had almost 1,700 who did actually finish a 35-minute survey, which is pretty long. Um, <clears throat> that's not the end, though, of the story. The, the waiting procedure that has to happen in order to really make it nationally representative data is that you take your, your raw data and you weight it against what we know of that particular population. So we know what the demographic distribution, geographic distribution of Mormons is in the United States pretty well. We have a really good idea of the gender distribution. We know a lot about the racial distribution. So then you see where your data does or does not match what we already know. And then you have to weight it so that, in our case, we had oversampled women Sorry, women, we, we have to make your voices a little less important and inflate the voices of, of men, particularly older men. It's like, because we don't hear enough from older men in Mormonism. <laughs> and then we also had oversampled uh, people with higher educational attainment, which is not unusual for surveys that are conducted online. I do want to say this is not the same as a convenience sample or a snowball sample. So if you're on Facebook and you see someone say, hey, take this survey, that's a snowball sample, and that is not nationally representative. It may be very interesting, and it may get really big numbers of respondents, because it's free, <laughs> lovely, but it's not going to be representative of a national population in the way that we need for academic research. Does that answer everything you wanted to know? Okay. Yes? Since your research has been available, which isn't very long, who has shown the most interest in it, and who do you expect it to be the most valuable to in the years to come? So the question is, since the research has been available, which has been five days, <laughs> um, who has shown the most interest in it, and, and in what way would I predict it's going to be helpful for people in the future? So far in the speaking that I've done over the course of the last year and a half, the people who have been most interested in this data are millennials themselves and their parents. Um, and I always keep in mind that in, in the Kickstarter campaign to raise money to support this, and by the way, there are people in this room who supported this research project from the beginning, including Dan Witherspoon sitting up here who's nodding. Um, thank you all for contributing to help make independent academic research about Mormonism possible. It's expensive, so it's, it's so appreciated. Anyway, um, <coughs> remind me of what I was talking about before I got into that. Who in the future will be the most interested? Oh. So I had a message from a parent, and I've kind of, it has stuck with me through this whole process. She said that she had four children who were millennials, and she wanted to, all four of them had left the church, and she wanted to understand why. So that's why she donated to the Kickstarter campaign. And for me, that was, uh, there were a couple of messages like that, and that was really interesting in helping me understand who are the potential readers and what is the use of research like this. I think that research like this has the potential to start very important conversations. At least that's what I'm hoping. <clears throat> a number of the people that I interviewed for the book who had left the church, um, and maybe there are people in this room who've had similar experiences, it was striking to me how few of them were able to talk in a real way with their families. 
about this experience. So sometimes they hadn't told their parents at all, and they were basically living in hiding. One of the opening stories in the book is like that. Sometimes they had had that really terrible, awkward, shaking conversation with their parents, and then nobody ever brought it up again. So it was the elephant in the room that no one could talk about. Whether it was because the parents were afraid of hurting their feelings or you know, contributing to that, but it, you know, to, to have ways to start those conversations, I think, is great. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. I'm I'm interested in how much, <clears throat> excuse me, in general, does the internet impact as far as presenting information, and then more specifically, maybe online discussions or groups like Reddit or with subreddits mm. and so on. <laughs> How much impact does that seem to have on millennials? That's a great question. It's about the internet and the impact that internet and, and social media, Reddit, might have on millennials and their religious choices, I would say. We don't know. And, you know, I'm skeptical of, of people who come forward and say that there's a direct causal relationship between internet activity and religious disaffiliation. We simply don't have enough information yet about that. It feels true, but a lot of things that feel true turn out not to be true. So the jury is still out. It is interesting in the research, specifically uh, when we were asking people, for example, about where they got the most helpful information about going to the temple for the first time. I was expecting that the internet would be much more relevant for this generation than it actually was. So that was interesting. All the way in the back. So the question is about my role as a researcher and the influence that I may or may not have on the church itself, and I think as a writer was what you said. I can't think about that, honestly, because if I ever think about that, I'm paralyzed and I can't write another word, <coughs> truly. And a, as a columnist, <coughs> I have to continue to write for myself. I've managed to tick off just about everyone on both sides of every question and I you know I have to just write what I think yeah I if it happens that's I guess good but I guess I'd be interested to know how you view your role versus someone who's not bringing data in who's current who's interpreting history in a more volatile situation mm. I think data is intensely important and valuable, and it does have, you know, I'm coming at this as a historian who was not trained as a social scientist. You know, that's why we have Ben. That's why we have other people who are helping. This really has been a team effort in many ways. Um, but it's been very interesting to me as an outsider to social science to come into that discipline in, even in a small way and observe how powerful data can be. Because as a historian, you can say, oh, well, you know, we have cyclical trends in American religion, and here's what this looks like. A lot of this happened in the 1920s. Maybe we're just all repeating ourselves. But then if you come in with numbers, well, suddenly it's very interesting how the conversation changes. The challenge, though, is that this is such a moving target. I mean, even between the time when I finished the first draft of the book about a year and two weeks ago, and general conference happened, so we had our first Apostles of Color. We had a lot of different changes happen, in gen and it was President Nelson's first ever general conference um, as the president. And then more changes happened in October with home and visiting teaching, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so 
this has been a fascinating experience as a historian about what it feels like to try to write about something that's happening in real time. It's not easy, is the, is the takeaway. Yes? So just to follow up, up that a little bit, not, I have not read your book and maybe you did address this, but uh, it seems like you would agree or we can mostly agree that millennials and younger seem to be driving a lot of changes in the church. Uh, more say than than my generation, baby boom generation, and yet in our day, baby boomers were considered pretty radical, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of societal change and evolution. Yeah. But not so much in the church. Well, what, let's what? let's talk about that because I think that's a really important thing. What he's saying is that you know, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, baby boomers were driving a lot of social change. Maybe not so much in the church, you say, but. It is happening in the wider culture, and the attention that's being paid to millennials now in the church as drivers of change, we've been here before. Is that kind of what you're saying? Well, I'm asking, there seems to be a difference, okay. quantitatively at least, and why, why is that? What, what do you think the factors are that contribute to the drive that's occurring now versus maybe a lack of change and real, real change, fundamental change, 40 or 50 years mm -hmm. ago? That's a great question. I think the, the larger religious landscape is the difference. Because really, 50 years ago, it was still not all that acceptable to not have a religion. And there wasn't an infrastructure of support existing for people who left the church. And that all exists now, which makes it much easier. I'm sorry, I'm not diminishing the pain of anyone who has left recently. I'm sure that it's painful. But it's less painful in terms of the infrastructure and support that exists for you than it was back then. One thing that I, I would point out, though, about you know, about the baby boomer generation in the church. <clears throat> Rebecca DeSchweinitz, who's a historian at BYU, has a really interesting article about youth culture in the late 1960s and how the LDS church responded to the youth culture. And it responded programmatically in a pretty brilliant way by emphasizing seminary, by building the institute program, by building the missionary program, um, releasing videos that, that kind of address some of these these things, I'd love to see them, but she, she writes about them in a really interesting way. And for me, what was fascinating about that is that it worked. So retention, it helped with retention. It helped to combat the youth culture that they were so worried about and the hippies and the long hair. And this is when we see BYU have its uh, emphasis on a certain grooming appearance in the honor code. Mm -hmm. This is what, what it happens. Um, I am not convinced, though, that a programmatic approach is going to help all that much with millennials today because institutional mindset is very different. We will see. Yes? So thinking, I've been thinking, as you just spoke about, about the late 60s and early 70s. I'm a baby boomer, and I'm fascinated to hear that the church took action which was successful in retention then, but perhaps planted some seeds that are driving our daughter's generation crazy. Yeah, thank she's, you for saying that. She's 26, and we have long conversations with her about it. She says to us, if church was on Saturday, she might be able to get over the anxiety before she had to go to work on Monday. Wow, okay, so just for the record, you're saying that for for this generation of baby boomers in the 60s, that the church had a very successful approach in dealing with that, but that the ramifications for that with your daughter's generation are actually negative. That for her generation, the very same things that proved to be successful are being a stumbling block for this generation. And, and very memorably, you said that church would need to be on Saturday for her in order to recover enough to go to work on Monday without being emotionally drained, I think. Yeah, that's very interesting, and I don't think she's alone in that particular assessment of some of the programs of the church, which is why solving the problem through additional programs uh, from the institutional level may or may not work. I think what our data showed that I found fascinating is how interested millennials are in the grassroots church on the local level. They're interested in having a relationship with their bishop. That was surprising to me, and very positive and hopeful. Um, most of them had a positive experience with seminary, if they went to seminary. So relationships are important. They had high response rates for home and visiting teaching, and the highest response of any generation for sharing their faith with others. 
So relationships are still incredibly important. Thank you. How are we on time, by the way? We're good. We're just good, right? We're not good. going to we're specify great. that. We're great. Okay, well, you all heard it from Kurt, so it must be gospel truth. Very yeah. Um Talk about how millennials navigate gender issues and if they're different in the ways that baby boomers and Gen Xers may have. Yeah, so how millennials navigate gender issues and if that's different from how baby boomers and, and Gen Xers have navigated those same issues. Yes, it's different. Um, and that's interesting to me because the book, I'm, I make the point from the very beginning that the book is telling two different stories. And one is that millennial Mormons are active in the church and they love the church and they're very orthodox. The other is that more are leaving than ever before. They, those seem like contradictory stories, but they are both true and they're happening at the same time. It's also the case with women's issues that you can legitimately say, based on data, that women who are staying in the church overall, they think it's fine. They don't have a problem with women not having the priesthood. A majority do not have a problem. Um, however, generationally that is changing and that became pretty clear in the data too, that younger women are more likely to be troubled than older women by a considerable margin. Also, you have to think about women who have left the church. And for women who have left the church, women's roles was the third most commonly cited reason for leaving. Mm -hmm. So that's significant too. You have to tell both of those stories to understand what's going on. I'm curious what your experience and those you interviewed, what impact did the knowledge, the information uh, explosion have on their decisions. In the last 20 years, you can access just about any kind of information, good or bad. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what impact did the internet have on people's decision to leave? Well, more, more oh. knowledge in general. I mean, oh, okay, the knowledge in general. Of, uh, mm -hmm. In every sector you can think of, science, whatever. We don't have a survey question that could ascertain that particular piece of information. That's a pretty specific thing that I'm not quite sure we could get at with a good survey question. It would be a very interesting challenge to try to design one that would, would get at that question. Um, in our former Mormon sample, if we're thinking about people who've left the church, actually most people had been gone for 10 years or more in the former Mormon sample. And so it's not that the internet didn't exist and knowledge didn't exist back then. You know, we actually had knowledge when I was a kid. You'll be shocked to hear <laughs> We expressed it differently. Um, but it is, uh, it is interesting to think about how recent that is. And it's a little early days to be able to say with any good effect, what effect you know, with any good definition, what effect that will have in the long term. Yes. I'm wondering if you, um, with all that you've learned through your data and your research, um, if you were contacted by the church and the leaders, and they asked for a recommendation of five things they, they could possibly do to help the situation, <coughs> could you elaborate on maybe those five things that you would recommend? It's so funny that you ask that, because I'm working on a talk on exactly this for April. Um, the question is, if you know, if wishes were horses and suddenly your opinion were coveted by people in power, which, you know, dream on, right? <laughs> what five recommendations would you make to the church to make things better? So this is a talk that I'm working on now um, for a conference that's happening about Mormon millennials at Claremont in, in April. And one of the issues is there has to be more local autonomy for if grassroots level is where millennials are going to be reached, let them be reached there. Let wards be different from each other. We have, and this is a modernist impulse, we have elevated to <coughs> sanctity the idea that the church should be the same everywhere. Why do we think that uniformity is gospel? It makes no sense to me. And I think increasingly it makes less and less sense as the church is global as well, which is something that we don't really address in this research because it's based in the United States. So that's one thing. Um, yeah, I have a list. <laughs> um, I'm interested in how social change over the years has impacted changes in doctrine and how you see current um, issues in the book potentially changing doctrine, if that's a possibility. I'm very flattered by the fact that you all seem to think that this research is going to actually change people's minds. I'm, you know, I'm not nearly as sanguine about that as you seem to be. So yay for your optimism, go you. 
<laughs> yeah. But the question is, uh, are there things in the book, re restate it just a little bit so I don't screw it up. Basically, due to my ignorance, I'm curious if social change has influenced doctrinal changes, mm -hmm. and if you see that happening in the future. Okay, so if social change has influenced doctrinal change, mm -hmm. yes. Historically, I think that that is hard to dispute. Um, we believe in the power of continuing revelation in the church, and we believe that revelation happens through a prophetic figure in the church. But you can also believe that change happens at the grassroots level, and those don't have to contradict each other. Um, we have a very interesting example with the 1978 priesthood temple revelation for African Americans and other people of African descent that change had been happening at the grassroots level. History had been done, really good history that Spencer W. Kimball read and was influenced by. And then he prayed and he had a revelation. So these things are working in tandem. That's what it means to be a church. All the way in the back. Did the research um, address at all the Heavenly Mother figure and the millennial view of her and um, her absence from focus? Thank you for bringing that up. So the question is about Heavenly Mother, whether the research addressed <coughs> Heavenly Mother, and is that particularly a, a relevant idea for millennials? Um, so there was no survey question about Heavenly Mother. That would be a very interesting thing to ask about. What, what role maybe do you think that she has? But it did come up in interviews, and that was pretty interesting. One woman told me, in fact, that Heavenly Mother, the existence of Heavenly Mother in Mormon theology was one of the things that kept her in the church. Even if it wasn't emphasized, just knowing that she had a mother was hugely important to her. It has been very interesting to me observing the conversation, you know, I'm a Gen Xer, I'm, I'm older, and it's apparent to me, because observing the conversation among women who are 15, 20 years younger than I am about Heavenly Mother and the, the need for Heavenly Mother, this kind of raw, aching need for Heavenly Mother. Um, I'm thinking about Rachel Steenblick's poetry and the reception to that. It's a beautiful book, <clears throat> but other things as well. And, what occurred to me, in fact, just last week, is how beautifully and effectively Mormon women of that age are doing exactly what they were programmed to do, which was think that motherhood is the most important thing. They are doing what they were told. They were told that having a mother was the most important thing in their lives and as, as mothers themselves. And then they're told that there's this heavenly mother figure that they can't talk to, they can't pray to, they can't learn more about. How does that make sense to them if they've grown up in a culture that has so heavily emphasized the role of motherhood? So, in fact, they're doing what they're supposed to do, theologically. Yes? Earlier, you talked about the reasons why women leave, and the, uh, the third reason on there was gender roles. Um, have you found an increase in more women leaving than men, uh, and why, mm -hmm. or is it the same? Mm -hmm. Good question. It's about gender and whether women are leaving at higher rates now than they used to, or higher rates than men. And traditionally, women have been the stalwarts of religion, not just in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but in Christian <coughs> religions more generally, also in Judaism, not so much in Islam in America, but for the most part, women have been the the bulwarks here. There is some evidence for younger people that that's changing, and that's very interesting to me. So in longitudinal studies, stretching back to the 1960s of the college freshman survey, I think I mentioned, at least I've mentioned at least once today to somebody, right? Um, um, and also the monitoring the future surveys of junior high and high school students. What you do see is that the most significant recent drops in the 21st century have happened among girls, specifically white girls of a lower socioeconomic background. So that's fascinating because it's new. That is not something that researchers would have necessarily expected. And it's definitely something to watch as we think about religion moving into the future. Because we've taken women for granted for a long time. And maybe that wasn't a good idea. Just, you know, throwing that out there. Yes. Um, 
you've mentioned that like with the last year there's been so many changes so as you've been looking at this data um, like I know you mentioned in the podcast the recent temple changes were interesting because it actually addressed some of the problems that you had seen in the survey are there other changes that you've seen in the last year that either would help alleviate some of the problems or maybe could even exacerbate some of the problems that you saw in the data great question so you know like I said this is a moving target and are the cha recent changes to the temple, are those going to be helpful? Other changes that we've seen um, to the church in the last year and a half or two years, will they help or hurt? Some of them I think are terrific, honestly. Uh, the move toward emphasizing ministering is relational inherently. Not that home and visiting teaching wasn't, but the whole act of keeping statistics, of reporting all of that, you know, it, it wasn't so much relational as a checkbox. And so if there is an opportunity to emphasize how important it is to build relationships at the ward level, then that's great, and that has the potential to do something important. The temple changes were a great surprise to me and delight to me. I think that was terrific. Had nothing to do with the research in this book. Those changes have been talked about for a long time. But it is interesting how many of the same issues came up with my interviewees that also apparently have come up in the church's own research. So that was quite fascinating to see. As far as future changes, I don't know, but I'll be watching. I'll be watching with great interest. Yeah. Are we okay for time? I just feel like yeah. you poor people. It's hot in here, you must be tired. It is seven o'clock. Okay, maybe just a couple more questions. Yes, oh, hello. Gosh. Um, this is a, if you were, if you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be? <laughs> if um, I were a tree, what kind of tree would I be? No, mostly it's, <laughs> did, did you have moments during this, or a moment during this, that really surprised you? Yeah. And then, what was your favorite experience through this whole process? Mm -hmm. So, did I have a moment that really surprised me in the course of this research, and also what was my favorite experience? Favorite experience is easy, it was doing the interviews. Um, doing the oral history interviews, most of which were done over the phone, but sorry, some of which were done in person. Uh, that was very powerful, as I mentioned before. And I think uh, Benjamin Noll and I are talking about doing a follow-up book that focuses primarily on the research about former Latter-day Saints. So people who have left the church who only get one chapter in this book, we have as much data about them, and it's a very important understudied population. So that's the direction that we're heading to try to understand that better. Um, Remind me of the very first part of the question. Surprised. Oh, there were so many things that surprised me, including that weird finding about temple garments, which you'll find in that temple chapter. So we don't have to talk about sex here. You know, mixed audience, whatever. <laughs> yeah, but the, I, I would say that the thing that surprised me most is coffee and how many Generation X and Millennial Latter-day Saints, including many who hold temple recommends and consider themselves active in the church, had had coffee. Yes? Uh, so I have two questions. The first one's really short. Were most of the people that you interviewed multi-generational Latter-day Saints, like their parents were Mormons or grandparents, how many were converts? Not very many were converts. So. Uh, that's a very good question. Most of these people had grown up in the church. There are a few examples of converts in the chapter on belief, um, including someone named Robin in the book and uh, one other person. And their perspectives were very interesting to me because it's not always the same. And I'm a convert myself, so that was particularly fascinating. Okay, awesome. So if I could follow that up with, uh, was there anything that you could identify as uh, a Mormon identity, and even for those who had left the church, was there something that they had retained that, I mean, if, you know, you grow up as a Mormon, it's a big part of your life, so how do people retain some of their Mormon upbringing even if they've left, or is there something we can identify as a, as a Mormon identity? That is such a great question. So is there something that we can identify as a core Mormon identity that <coughs> holds true even for people who have left the church? That was very interesting. One thing that I only barely mention in the book is that we did have a series of questions about child rearing and what are the most important traits that you think should be instilled in children today. And for current and former Mormons, aside from religious faith being one of them for current Mormons, and it was not important for former Mormons, the others were almost in lockstep. 
responsibility, hard work, good manners. You know, former Mormons are not all that different from current ones and how they're raising their kids and the values that they want to instill, I would say. All the way in the very back, standing. Um, I understand that this is kind of a snapshot of a moving target, obviously, um, of these people. Do you feel that your research that I was able to paint a picture at all of the transition for people who have left or were thinking about leaving the church, kind of that liminal phase? Like, what does mm -hmm. that look like? Great question. The question is about the liminal phase for people who are in the process of leaving the church before they have left, maybe they have one foot in either camp. And yeah, that was interesting because seven out of ten of the former Mormon respondents said that it had taken them at least six months to decide to leave the church. So a lot of people are living in that liminal space for months or even years. And I think that that's a, a part of the equation that you certainly don't hear in LDS contexts when when currently identified Orthodox Mormons are talking about people who've left, they make it sound like it was a very rash decision that suddenly you got upset. Some the clueless thing that someone said in sacrament meeting, you stood up and said, I'm never darkening this door again, and you walked out and never came back. It, that's ridiculous. So it's a constellation of multiple factors, and it takes a long time, and it's also excessively painful. That's what we're finding from the research. Oh, sure. A harmless family question. The meaning of your daughter's name is interesting. How did you oh. yeah. Well, thank you. So you're asking about the meaning of my daughter's name. My daughter is Jerusha, J-E-R-U-S-H-A. And in Hebrew, it, it essentially means inheritance or legacy. Yeah. Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> Let's take just one more question, and then you can all breathe and have lemonade or whatever you, snacks we're, you have. We're having Sanka. <laughs> just, just to make it clear, the footnote that Kurt was talking about is about decaffeinated coffee. He is in possession of a very important primary source, and, and it is truly important, primary source from the 1960s in, when, in which the First Presidency gave permission for church members to have Sanka, which is what we would call decaffeinated coffee. So you owe it all to Kurt when you're having your decaf. Be sure to remember him. Last question there in the back in the spot. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a Utah question, and it's the first one that's been political. I'm wondering uh, if in your study of the data, um, what percentage of millennials or anybody else uh, considers the Holy Ghost to be Republican. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're just going to have to add that on to the next survey. Do you think the Holy Ghost is a Republican? Uh, for some reason, we didn't ask that question. We did ask people, do you identify as a Republican? And that was very interesting. Um, the, the political data in our survey, I think, is not entirely trustworthy. And let me tell you why. I think that we've fielded a terrific survey. But it is a snapshot in time, and a survey is, it, it has the potential to fall prey to the timing in which it was conducted. And guess when our survey was conducted? Oh, no. September and October of 2016. If there was ever a time that Mormons were a little bit suspicious of the Republican Party, it was September and October of 2016. So the fact that our numbers are double-digit drop from what Pew has had as Mormon Republican identification, we only had 57% who said that they identified or leaned as Republican. That's not high enough. So, But I think that it's about the timing of the survey. Mormons were having a bit of an identity crisis with this completely controversial non-establishment Republican candidate who really they, they did not support in a moral fashion, you know, so, so non-traditionally um, opposed to many of the, the personal morality values that Mormons have been taught to hold dear. Yeah. Generationally, we also did see that, that difference. So baby boomers uh, and also Gen Xers, majority are Republican. For millennials, it was 46%, I think, Republican, 41% Democrat, 13% Independent. Somebody do the math and tell me, does that add up to 100? Because I'm very tired. I think it was 46, 41, 13. What we see politically for millennials in general, not just in the LDS church, 
is that in the, the rise of an independent affiliation is becoming important for them. And that's interesting as we're thinking about authority, as we're thinking about institutions, that they're, they're fed up with political parties. That is one more institution that may have failed them. So let's stop on that very cheerful note. <laughs>